humans began in Mother Africa, although nomads began walking out soon after the taming of fire. Cooking food changed metabolisms by reducing energy required to process plants. Stomachs got smaller while brains grew larger. Bigger brains brought better tools and weapons. There were several migrations out of Africa over millennia, and a few of these independent species collided in the foothills of the Hindu Kush, where stoner culture was born. Like the cannabis plant, the steppe culture migrated along the Oxus River toward the Caspian and Black Seas. Just as cooking food had a positive impact on African brains, cannabis had a similar impact on the people of the Asian steppes. The horse was first domesticated by these people near the northern banks of the Black Sea. They were small at first, used to pull carts, provide milk and meat, and only later to be ridden. The smelting of bronze likely began around this same area. Little is known for sure about these steppe people who evolved into the first knights, probably because their story is steeped in cannabis worship, which became forbidden knowledge when cannabis was disappeared by the Catholics and others. King Arthur is an update on Hercules. Both avatars had 12 ordeals because both are sun avatars, just like Jesus and his 12 disciples. Hercules was born in ancient Scythia and later adopted by the Greeks, who considered Scythians untamed savages because they were illiterate and wore trousers. Scythians believed souls had to cross a bridge to reach their version of Valhalla. Various angels and demons guarded the entrance, and if you weren't righteous enough, they'd hurl you over the side into a vast chasm below. Scythians grew immensely wealthy by running the slave, spice, and drug trades, connecting Europe with the Far East. For millennia, the sight of a gang of Marauding Scythian teens on horseback was to Greeks and Persians, exactly as gangster drug-dealing teens in Lambos brandishing AKs out the window are today. The Scythian invention of the short-scale recumbent bow was the AK of the steppes, and ten-year-olds were adept enough to fire arrows at 50 yards while galloping away on horseback. The arrows were dipped in snake venom incubated in blood, so only a grazing scratch was required to ensure near-instant death. We know this because some of the wounded warriors buried with their weapons in Kurgan graves were only ten at death. The Scythians got elaborate full-body tattoos soon after birth, and the Art Nouveau-like designs included mythical and real animals, sometimes locked in predatory ceremonies of death. Children were raised collectively by blinded slaves and referred to all adults as mother and father. They were often shipped to distant clans to bind the communities. Boys and girls were trained as mounted assassins from birth and allowed to have sex upon puberty, but could not officially marry until they'd killed an enemy combatant in battle, a rule for both sexes. Women held the same rights as men and could walk away at any time to start a new community. Whenever a teen made their first kill, the coming-of-age ceremony was held as quickly as possible. The deceased was scalped, decapitated, and skullcap removed to be deployed as a chalice for drinking the victim's blood. The skullcap would be taken back and encased in gold or bronze to be used thereafter as that person's chalice for drinking an elixir made of cannabis, milk, and spices. This is the true origin of the Christian Eucharist, as well as the myth of the Holy Grail. According to Scythian legend, three golden objects fell out of the sky near the Black Sea, a cup, a plow, and an axe. These implements were too hot to touch, but one day a boy was able to pick them up, and eventually he evolves into Heracles, and his descendants become the royal Scythians. A caste system held farmers and herders on the bottom, warriors on horseback in the center, and royals on top. Royals were raised apart from the rest, and their armor made of gold, and their helmets rose higher than the others. The conical hats we associate with witchcraft today was a Scythian invention, as were the liberty caps worn by insurgents during the French Revolution. 
Boys and girls looked and dressed alike and deployed the same weapons and were equally deadly on the field of battle. So the myth gradually arose. The steppe people were really a tribe of women who called themselves Amazons. The same technology and skill that created the recumbent bow also invented the lyre as the materials required are identical. Scythian archers became well represented in Greek pottery and Persian monuments, but so did Scythian musicians. Spirituality flows through music, and the earliest advancements came out of the harmonics of string links, which led into the golden ratio. A great spiritual awakening took place in Balkh. It eventually demolished the pagan pantheons, replacing dozens of gods with one to rule them all. This awakening was linked with elevations in mathematics and astronomy. Persians had the huge advantage of a written language, so it was easier for them to keep evolving the Scythian advances in arts and science. During this process, warrior heroes were replaced by sacred monks. The battle axe became a wooden walking stick and then a wand. Armor was replaced by robes and bronze helmets became hemp turbans. Cyrus was Persia's first Zoroastrian tribal leader, and he created a mighty Persian empire while Greece and Rome were uncultured backwaters. Cyrus conquered the ruling Babylonian kingdom and outlawed slavery, which had been the foundation supporting that corrupt empire. He freed the Jews and gave them funds to rebuild their temple in Jerusalem, provided they wrote down their rules. Cyrus did not trust oral traditions. He didn't force Jews or anyone else to become Zoroastrian as he believed in freedom of religion and home rule. So when the Jews wrote down their history years later, they fashioned their avatar Moses on a composite of Cyrus and Zoroaster. The parts about being noble-born, discarded, and rediscovered came from Cyrus. The parts about meeting a burning bush and getting stone tablets with God's official rules inscribed came from Zoroaster. Zoroaster was a vegetarian, and his basic tenets involved purity of thought, word, and deed. It wasn't enough to speak good words if they weren't backed up by good thoughts and deeds. He invented monotheism. The Scythian bridge to the afterlife became known as Shinvat Bridge. Pythagoras was born on the Greek colony of Samos and was among the first Greeks to travel to Persia to study with the Magi, the Zoroastrian Brain Trust. When he returned, Pythagoras created a secret society based on Zoroastrian principles. The reason the Magi make a brief appearance in the New Testament at the birth of Jesus is because the original Christians were reviving Zoroastrian roots of Judaism, which included vegetarianism and cannabis intoxication. The activist confrontation at the temple was not about money, but ritual murder of animals and birds for feeding wealthy Jews on high holiday. The Magi and Pythagoreans did everything in secret and left no notes. We know they celebrated the rising and setting sun with epic jams and concentrated heavily on the study of harmonics because music and math represented God's language. But the Pythagoreans were also involved with the Zoroastrian sacrament of cannabis intoxication. Although instead of drinking cannabis and milk, they preferred burning cannabis flowers in bronze tripods to fumigate tents and rooms, a technique also invented in Scythia. Inhaling fumes provided a quicker path to intoxication. Pythagoras had a secret symbol used to identify members the pentagram, and developed several degrees of initiation with elaborate rituals for marking each one. The only parts of this culture that have survived were passed on to the Templars, who handed them off to Freemasons after the French Pope outlawed the order.